So we're recording now. I see. It. Okay. So it is my great pleasure to welcome uh, my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Ga Donna Gaffney. Dr. Gaffney is an advanced practice nurse who specializes in um, psychiatric mental health support for um, families, children, adults, communities um, it, in terms of grief, trauma, and um, the, the related support. So thank you, Dr. Gaffney, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Morrow. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is the photo that we use for every beginning, every webinar, webinar because we really want uh, people to know that they are safe in, in, and will be learning things to really help themselves. And I also would like to check in with all of you to make sure that you are doing um, the self-care that you really need to do at this point in time. There, um, I have to admit, I was listening to Anne Marie's report and the Dean's report and Dr. Simon's report, and um, you, you really are to be commended for the extraordinary work that you've been doing to reach out to your students. So um, this session is, is really uh, about you and about some of the things that you uh, should be doing, could be doing to uh, take care of yourself, but really we're gonna be talking about a concept that um, has been talked to, to mention quite a bit um, recently, and that is the, um, you know, uh, the whole notion of moral suffering. It has been referred to as an umbrella term that really includes um, things like moral uh, concepts of, of moral distress, moral injury, moral outrage, moral apathy, and moral residue. So I'm going to go over some of that with you and, and actually talk about some of the, um, the, the, the difficulties with um, conceptual and theoretical um, analysis of this concept, and then lastly, what we can do about this. So just to, to back up a little bit, um, Certainly, we've been hearing how the um, how the, this pandemic has really forced many of us to look at the healthcare uh, professionals who are on the front lines. We've heard that word used so often, front lines, uh, as in a military um, comparison, and it's really true that it is um, very much of a military model that we're we're really seeing and con and confronting with our. Um, our colleagues in healthcare. So we know that um, this vulnerability that that we see in our frontline uh, healthcare providers are, is certainly affecting the quality of care, but it really has a, a major effect on quality of life, and which ultimately influences certainly the commitment to the nursing profession. And I've been speaking to a number of um, healthcare organizations and they are worried that they're going to lose a lot of their um, their staff. So um, this is not the first time that this issue has come up. Um, the work that was done in Toronto after the SARS epidemic um, really addresses this issue and what they did to um, some of the people in Toronto and Canada to sort of mediate and, and uh, change the way the outcomes. Um, I also want to mention that you all are um, not immune to any of these vulnerabilities, as I'm sure all of you have felt over the past month, uh, six weeks. Um, and in fact, nursing faculty may be at greater risk because you're coping with multiple organizational and environmental settings, administration decisions and positions, at, um, procedures at the highest university levels, and then the individual choices and decisions that your schools, professional schools make, then you've got, you're dealing with clinical agency requirements and expectations. I mean, I heard it in just 10 minutes of presentations. Um, your students' needs, their families' needs, some of the issues that their families are bringing up that makes it very difficult for you to uh, really um, help them because they're, they may be getting pressure. If they have their own families, they're, you know, under, with kids, they may be dealing with um, 
schooling and living and they can't work maybe perhaps under the same roof, they may be an essential, essential employee. So it really becomes very difficult. And so all of these multiple levels of organizational um, perspectives come crashing down. And so as all of you are facing your academic responsibilities with your students and then your own responsibilities, if you, some of you are practicing, um, you also are dealing with many of those um, same things. So we're going to try to um, address some of these, um, the issues that you're dealing with. This is a, a, a sort of a, a symbolic of, um, of what is happening now in healthcare. We are, there's a tsunami that is washing over us and knocking us down. And moral distress can certainly negatively impact patient care. And it may actually have the impact of causing our profession, members of our profession to avoid certain clinical um, situations and, and perhaps ultimately leave the profession. Um, I want to, uh, the way I'm going to be approaching um, today's session is first to talk about the conceptual and theoretical um, elements of, of moral suffering. And then I want to bring you to a more experiential uh, um, way of looking at moral suffering. And Roshi Joan Halifax is probably one of the um, major contributors, along with Cinder Rushton, um, who have talked a lot about moral distress and how we look at it. And um, there's a, there's a, in the link, uh, there, the bibliography is at the end of the session, there's a link to actually listen to, um, to Roshi Joan. So it's really uh, a wonderful, wonderful thing and it's um, really important for all of us. So, so Roshi Joan says moral suffering includes moral distress, moral injury, moral outrage, and moral apathy. And we really have to be um, aware how this, um, how the conventional hope can drive us to violate our integrity when we are um, a toy of our expectations. In other words, we really think that everything should be um, organized and, and maybe, um, you know, it should be perfect. It's, this is not a time for perfection. So I think that we really need to be clear about that. So the person who really thought, uh, uh, first addressed um, moral distress is Jameson in 1984, a philosopher that talked about what nurses are experiencing. And of course, I hesitated and said, hmm, there's someone else writing about what nursing is experiencing when nurses are really the best prepared and the most articulate in addressing our needs. Um, but it, essentially, it's when we know what the morally correct thing is to do or maybe avoid doing. And we are constrained by both internal and external factors. And there is distress that occurs at the time of this potential action or inaction. And then there is reactive distress later on. And our integrity is comprised, uh, compromised as a result of these core values being violated. It sounds clear, it's actually not so clear. Um, there have to be necessary and sufficient conditions of moral distress. So the first necessary uh, condition is a moral judgment is made, and then there's also the institutional constraints that prevent this moral judgment from being acted upon. So therefore, the constrained moral judgment is both necessary and um, necessary for this to occur. Um, and sufficient. Uh, this is a, from Morley et al. who did a wonderful study um, looking at all of the, the, you know, a narrative synthesis of the concepts related to moral distress. So interesting that um, if you look at the number of studies done, and this is after they were, ex uh, there was extraction, inclusion, inclusion, exclusion, and criteria applied, you can see the numbers of studies that um, are really addressing um, the uh, moral distress in nursing and medicine, and ultimately the number of, of papers that were subjected um, to this analysis. So this is, um, any of you who are teaching in this area um, or would find it interesting to read this, it really is. So first let's talk about the psychological and the physical uh, effects. Um, we know that we hear nurses talking about their frustration, their anger, and you probably have felt some of that over this past uh, two months. 
psychological and physical exhaustion, helplessness, distress, and certainly depression. And the physical um, responses, sleeplessness, nausea, migraines, gastrointestinal upset, cheerfulness, physical exhaustion. You'll hear people talking about the very vivid dreams that they're having. And um, that is something that is across the board, but that also prevents you from getting um, enough sleep. And some of the constraints on actions, uh, it's very interesting that um, there have been moral distress scales and revised scales that have been, uh, been developed, but they seem to be measuring different concepts. And um, when we talk about the ethical climate, the constraints on a nurse's moral identity, the responsibilities that we have, relationships, not necessarily a specific external cause. So some of these are internal. Um, constraints. And then there's the whole idea of the knowledge or the epistemic injustice. And that is something that has been written about extensively. The nurse's knowledge is dismissed, undermined, or ignored. And that alone can really prompt in a incredible, a prompt, uh, excuse me, prompt an incredible response from our um, colleagues. And then the internal or the personal constraints, self-doubt, lack of assertiveness, socialization of the two follow orders. And of course, we are seeing all of this right now as we're addressing the lack of, um, lack of PPE, um, who should get the ventilators, long, long hours, multiple shifts. So one of the questions that uh, came up in an earlier session that we were doing um, in the webinar series, uh, someone very, you know, painfully and, and emotionally as what, how can I say no if somebody asks me to work an extra shift and how do I say no because I have exams coming up and I have my responsibilities and I think this is something that probably all of you are hearing uh, or sensing in your students. Um, so the, this knowledge is, is incredibly, this injustice is, in, we have to pay attention to that as well. Just getting used to WebEx sensitivity. Jeanette has, uh, Dr. Manchester has walked me through it many times. Um, moral integrity. So moral distress occurs when one knows the ethically appropriate action to take, but we're unable to act on it. And it's contrary to our personal values, our professional values, and undermines our integrity and our, our authenticity. And AACN uh, addressed this in a statement in 2006. Uh, another study done by Thomas and McCullough stated that moral um, distress could be divided into six philosophical categories, challenges to threats to and violations to personal integrity as well as personal professional integrity. And there's all kinds of different degrees. So you can see that the, the concept is broadening with people adding more and more to it, which becomes um, a real issue. Um, so what elements of um, moral distress do we really um, need to think about being necessary and sufficient? And they must experience um, psychological distress. If it's just making a decision or not being able to make a decision and there's no psychological distress, it really doesn't fulfill the, um, the whole criteria for, for this particular concept. So there has to be the experience of the moral event or the decision, as well as the experience of psychological distress. And that distress has to be connected to that event and that decision making. We know that our students and our colleagues are very distressed right now, but it may be not due to the moral um, decisions that they have to make, but, they, but their home life, their family life, balancing everything, getting their work done. So that really doesn't fulfill the same um, criteria. And then there's um, the moral outrage. Um, I had a student, a former student talking to me the other day and she um, talked about how she was struggling with a number of different uh, issues that, uh, that she saw in her clinical setting and that she felt that she just couldn't hold it in anymore and literally exploded at a colleague. And I, I thought it was fascinating that she was only felt so badly about her expression of the, her concerns, not the concerns her, themselves. So I had to remind her 
were you right? Were, was it appropriate for you to address this? And she thought about it for a while and said, well, yeah. And, and then she said, but I feel so badly I was a jerk in the clinical setting. So sometimes working with people um, to really talk about the principle of moral outrage, that we can really begin to express what is important for our patients, for ourselves, for our clinical settings, and then um, put it out there in, an, in a um, more effective way. So very often the moral outrage involves both anger and disgust. Um, unethical, um, unethical situations really drive us to, um, to take action and demand justice and accountability. And we certainly see that in the political arena. Um, our own internal experience, um, we, can, we can really have the extremes of righteousness and casting shame and doubt on the institution or on others. Um, but principles of moral outrage is that there can be a balance. Um, I think it's fascinating. I don't know if any of you are on Twitter, but there's um, hashtag nurse Twitter where nurses um, really be, express their beliefs about everything from the political climate and decisions being made at state and federal levels, as well as <laughs> some of the issues that are occurring on their own clinical settings. So, <clears throat> excuse me, there's, um, so that's something that we really have to address. And that actually begins um, in, in the educational program. How do we allow students to express those, um, those thoughts, those emotions, in a way that is really going to move um, move us forward and have us be really important members of the, the healthcare setting that will make change, that nurses will have the power that we so deserve. Um, Dr. Daphne, we have a couple of yeah. comments, if I might sure. share those with you. Absolutely. So, um, I'm, so, I'm sorry I didn't mention about asking questions. That's okay. I, I I chatted everyone and they're right on top of that, so you don't have to worry. <laughs> okay. Um, so oh, we have a, a faculty comment uh, from Dr. Amita Avadani that the dreams, including the continuation of the work done during the shift are real and that some days this whole thing seems like a dream. It's surreal to walk through the hospital. The stress and anxiety are quite palpable and that exercise and meditation help also real are the COVID pounds from overeating, which we've talked about. And another comment from Dr. Mary Jo Bugle that the total fatigue and sleeping disturbances are quite real, very real. Very, it's so important. Um, there, we are actually um, developing a, um, a series of resources for um, the webinar series, but one is about healthy sleeping and how do you begin to change that? I mean, I think that because everyone is experiencing this on some degree, I mean, the first thing that you can do is actually, you know, put in some sleep hygiene procedures. Um, about when you use your phone. And I know all of you are working fast and furiously to get things done, but you really have to provide time for self-care. 10 minutes a day, five minutes a day, especially before you go to bed at night is so crucial. So those comments are, are certainly well-deserved and well-placed and, and we are all dealing with this. As for the COVID pounds, um, you know that um, carbohydrates are the comfort food of choice, um, but you also have to balance that with looking at things, looking at foods and eating foods that really provide a sense of well-being um, from a health perspective and a nutrition perspective. So um, we actually talked about that in one of the webinar series uh, sessions about the importance of eating, you know, the vitamin B foods and all of that to promote a feeling of a uh, sense of well-being. So. Um, Yes, yeah, so all, of, all of this is true, but it really begins with self-care. Um, you know, think, um, think about when you're on a plane, if any of us ever get on a plane again, um, that they, when the, the flight attendants walk us through, you know, put on your own oxygen mask first and then put it on a child or an elder person next to you. Um, self-care is the oxygen mask that you put on yourself first. It's just so crucially important. Um, so, and so please, um, I know Anne-Marie, you're monitoring, so uh, it's great to have your questions and your comments uh, and to be able to share this information with your colleagues. Um, 
So moral injury is another term that is in this, within this umbrella, uh, a term of moral um, suffering. And that's the psychological wound resulting from witnessing or participating in mor a morally distressing act or anticipating a morally transgressive act. And I can only think of all the times that we're now watching um, sound bites and visual clips of, of these very events where you we're, we're listening to someone talk about um, how difficult it is to be in a critical care setting and that um, they, they look wounded. Um, and Roshi Joan um, Halifax actually said at one point, we see the marks on the faces of the nurses and physicians who are taping the N95 hopefully masks to their faces so they can see and they're well protected. But the real wounds are, you can see in their eyes, um, the real um, power of being in those situations and being, feeling helpless and not being able to make a difference and not being able to get the, the, um, the equipment that they need, the staffing that they need. So, um, but it it's, can be very harmful for us to keep watching those things. I think it is far more um, helpful and less distressing to read comments, uh, read articles rather than watching them on um, the TV and especially not before you go to bed at night because that's what's going to really feed into the, that dream scenario. So the moral injury is really a toxic a combination of dread, of guilt, and of shame, all of those things. While we might not be as a nurse directly or purposely involved in such acts, we are under the influence of the institutions and or the conditions. And I think this is so powerful um, at this time. Uh, I've talked to a couple of colleagues and um, asked them what she thought, what, what was one person, what, um, she's an OBGYN, what she thought was going on in terms of the equipment. And she said, I don't, think, I don't think the hospital is thinking any more than one or two days in advance. I don't think there's any long-term planning. I think they're just trying to get through each day. And she told me some of the, um, the procedures they were following for using the, the masks. And if someone you know is tested positive, then you throw the mask away. Otherwise, the masks are masks go um, repurposed and rec not repurposed, but cleaned. Um, in a way that they find it useful in the hospital, and they use them four or five days. And she said, I, I think that they have enough, but I think that they're stockpiling and getting ready for wave two and wave three. So, um, so there's very little being shared with um, individuals in the, in the hospital settings, and, which can be um, very, very traumatic for individuals because you feel, the, for nurses, for physicians, because you feel like you don't know what the reality is. So there's that violation also that, that can experience. Um, moral apathy, um, it's so interesting that this term, we all know what apathy means, but moral apathy really has a, a, a greater depth to it. Ignoring the suffering of others, especially those we are serving. And um, it can arise in response to our environmental situation in ways in which the current pandemic impact, um, the impact that we know what is so familiar. So this pandemic is impacting everything that we thought we knew about um, the way we characterize our profession and the way we interact with other people. It can lead to a sense of numbness, withdrawal. It's not indifference, it's, it has greater depth to it. And it's not freedom from moral feelings, but the absence of the affect some, have, some people have described it as, yeah, I don't care, or it doesn't matter. Um, I don't have a voice anyway. And, and I've actually heard some nurses um, actually say that. Um, when I um, heard um, Rosha Joan Halifax um, speak, she talked about this film um, about James Baldwin. And she said the idea of moral apathy became abundantly clear to her as she watched this film. And the, um, the quote on the screen is actually from James Baldwin in response to the, um, 
the um, racism that and the systemic racism that occurs in this country. Um, so uh, he said that he was terrified of moral apathy, the death of the heart, which is happening in my country. And um, you know he he spoke about that so eloquently. And it was, but it was watching him say those words that really brought home um, the point for her. So moral residue is another concept, and that's um, as as you might think. What's what's left after the moral distress and and the moral apathy? And those are when we have these unmet obligations and commitments that remain. Uh, when we have to make hard choices and prioritize one value over another. You know, it's said that every decision there is actually two competing obligations or commitments. I would dare say that today during this COVID uh, pandemic, there are probably many more than two. Even when we think we're making the best decision that we possibly can, there's still those obligations and commitments that have been unmet. It stays with us. We experience the guilt, the regret, that we haven't been able to meet all of those commitments and obligations. And it accumulates, this moral residue accumulates and sits with us. And it becomes, it becomes another factor that we have to deal with. And clinicians and many of us in this greater landscape of our country are actually working with issues related to moral residue, sheltering alone or with others. And I think that that's what makes um, this so much more um, difficult is that nurses who are working on the front lines are in um, who are in critical care areas, ICU, emergency rooms, um, having to move from a, of a setting with, that they knew so well into a setting that is completely foreign to them or or somewhat foreign, and <clears throat> and then have to go home where they shelter in place, so they, they um, are locked down, or they have family members, or they're as kids and they're schooling. And, and this goes for all of you as well, that um, I've, you, you know, the first week of um, <clears throat> the lockdown that we've all experienced, <coughs> excuse me, um, it was, it was a, sort of, a, uh, there were lots of memes and jokes and everyone was laughing about you know, being at home all the time because I think all of us denial that this was really going to um, uh, continue. Um, the kids were sort of part of part of the joke. All the kids who were homeschooling, and then by the end of the second week, the reality sunk in, and that it was almost impossible if you were working full time, as as many of you are, um, and maybe have kids at home, and are homeschooling them, or have parents that you're concerned about. Um, suddenly, this moment in time just really caused us to think about every single thing we were dealing with in ways that we had never, ever considered before. Um, so it has become a real big um, moment where we are feeling so distressed and thinking that we should do the right thing. And we've heard nurses on the front line say, when I'm at home, I feel like I should be at work. I'm thinking about my patients. When I'm at work, I'm, think, I'm thinking about the kids at home. And I'm sure that you know, you're, those of you who are, have families working at home, uh, trying to balance the needs of your kids, your family, and then still trying to balance the needs of your students and the last person whose needs get balanced and are, are your own. And so that really becomes a very distressing uh, experience for all of you. And of course, you're thinking, am I making the right decision? Am I doing the good enough job? I may not be doing the perfect job, but is, is this a good enough job? Um, and, and much of what we can do to really address how to change the way we experience moral di distress um, begins within our nursing education system and our healthcare system. Burnout was already at high levels before the pandemic. Now we have an opportunity in the midst of the pandemic to look at the healthcare cultures where nurses find themselves functioning. Um, cumulative work demands, stress in a toxic workplace and the loss of meaning. Work that is too intense, too much work just undoes everyone. 
So how do we begin to change that in, in our healthcare system and in our um, educational system? We have to look at what is really happening. And I, I heard um, some of you talking about the research that you're, you're going to be um, embarking on. And I think this is very, very important. How has this moment in time, how will this moment in time, time affect the way that we process this information, change the way we are um, educating, change the way we interact with students and, and clinical settings. We also have to look at the structural violence and systemic um, discrimination. Certainly that has come roaring into um, our consciousness as we look at um, who, gets, who gets the PPE, who doesn't get it, um, and who survives. And I, I was listening yesterday to um, the mayor of New York City, and he addressed this very specifically, and he's put into place a committee to begin to address some of the systemic um, discrimination that goes on, especially in light of, of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And the institutional demands that we are um, addressing at every single level. How do we really function and, and provide what we need um, for our students, for each other in these moments? And the missed appraisals of compassion, the, the way that we are dealing with um, moral distress and, and moral suffering needs to begin with compassion. It needs to begin with self-compassion. And uh, if you um, get a chance to look at webinar, this second and third, third webinar where we talk about self-compassion and compassion, um, really, will, is, will there be some great references and tools for you to use? Because that is really the foundation for all of this. So the challenge um, for all of us is how do we survive this? And what new ways um, can we work skillfully with emotional and somatic dysregulation generated by moral distress? It begins with self-care, self-compassion, and mindfulness. Um, these are the strategies that everyone is talking about on, on a, um, a mental health, um, COVID-19 mental health task force, and we're working with UCSF and Stanford, and this is where every, this is the beginning point that everybody is using to address um, the stress that is uh, really surrounding everyone and the self-compassion that needs to occur as the foundation. Um, we also need to have techniques that are directed to cognitive, affective, attentional, and somatic awareness and self-regulation. The very comments that we heard earlier really speak to us being able to name what we are experiencing. And so those, those moments of including approaches derived from the contemplative traditions are really very, very helpful and the foundation. Um, so when we look at moral distress, um, some of the ways that we can heighten awareness about it is find new ways to support the effective moral agency of clinicians at every level of power and authority. Give courageous voice matters of conscience without fear of resistance, dismissal, or reprisal. And we certainly have been seeing a lot of healthcare providers talking about those issues that sometimes hospitals are striking back with um, with, uh, with uh, penalties and uh, removing them from their positions, um, but those voices have to be heard. Um, and again, this is this principled outrage that we need to really address. Um, we have to have realistic hope um, that these constructive, constructive protests and creative ideas will be heard and taken seriously. And there's an urgent need for the design of innovative approaches and people are looking at very different uh, ways of looking at that, uh, just design thinking. Um, people after the SARS epidemic in Canada use some very, very unusual approaches as a means of dealing with moral distress. And to learn skills that foster moral resili resilience and enhance moral um, efficacy. Um, because there are so few studies on nursing education, there's a number of studies about nursing students experiencing moral distress, but not very many studies about nursing faculty, which I found interesting. Um, but one study, this um, was done um, by Nelson Marsh, 
uh, talks about the way we can begin to intervene in programs using mindfulness strategies, communication strategies. How do we address, how do we face the communicate, face what we're dealing with, then assess how we're going to, get to approach it, communicate, and then evaluate, and that's what this model is on the side. Um, so I think that those are really looking at organizational communication skills. Again, the fear of reprisal can be very powerful in, in silencing nurses, and we have to learn uh, a way to help our students express themselves and how we can express ourselves so that they see us as models and mentors. And we really need to um, re-examine uh, moral distress. I, um, several papers uh, have looked at the extraordinary work done by feminist theorists and feminist ethics. And, and of all of the work that I sort of reviewed in preparation for this, um, this presentation today, this really resonated with me, with feminist ethics. And I, I knew that back in the old days when I used Nell Nodding's work on caring, um, that I found a foothold in looking at uh, feminist ethics and feminist theory. But um, Peter and Leoshenko have done a lot of work on this. Um, and they see it as an emancipatory approach committed to changing the uneven distributions of power and privilege in everyday life, which often results in blurred boundaries between ethics and politics. And how moral agents experience moral distress can account for who they are personally and professionally. We're in a great position to bring others together to begin to create this kind of change and paradigm shift through dialogue and modifications in our practice. I think it's just so important for us to be able to communicate that to each other and to our students. And um, accounting for and communicating values and responsibilities and repairing damaged moral identities through the creation of counter stories. Now, because of my psych mental health experience, I am, um, and my approach using narrative, um, I found this a fascinating approach um, based on the work of um, Hildegard Nelson using counter stories. In other words, when we are damaged by the stories that we live every day, we create a counter story that, that really allows us to move forward in a new direction. And um, some, of the, um, some of the constraints that we're experiencing to be able to write about that and write about how we um, are knowledgeable and trustworthy professionals to repair the damaged moral identities that we're experiencing at this time. And, uh, you know, it's uh, that whole idea that nurses are the, um, and we, I know we've all, I've, I've certainly experienced this as a psych mental health clinician, that nurses are the touchy-feely uh, professionals. And of course, we all know that that's not true. We have the ability to see um, holistically, but we are, our practice is based on science and on research. And we nearly, really need to write those counter stories that portray nurses as skilled caregivers with serious responsibilities that require knowledge, skill, virtue. And, um, and they also have, the, these stories also have the ability to portray nurses as powerful, um, create counter stories that can act as forms of resistance that place significance on the nurse's power as opposed to vulnerability. And Peter and Leoshenko actually point out that by focusing so much on moral distress, are we actually blaming the victim or the nurse for some of the issues that we're facing now? And I think the counter stories really can help combat that. Um, so I'm, I'm very intrigued by this and uh, it would be wonderful if some of your um, doctoral students could, could investigate the counter stories and how they uh, are really going to help um, and, uh, really change things uh, during this, um, this pandemic. Um, so you've asked uh, some questions and made some comments. Um, I think that when we focus on um, the education of future healthcare professionals and ethicists, it underscores our relevance as professionals working together as opposed to working in silos and to adjust the focus beyond the medical model to that of health equity and social justice. 
And um, I find it very um, interesting when I read pieces written by physicians, how they're suddenly more aware about the, the um, interacting with their patients. The uh, NewJersey.com had this whole piece about how a physician was there when, you know, the patient woke up and it's something that we have been doing forever, but we're not telling this story. We need to tell the story. And, uh, and I think that um, some of the um, people in our webinars have said, um, you know, should they listen, should they read the social media posts that their colleagues are writing? And I, I said that that I thought it was a great idea because you're really listening to another person's narrative and you, you can respond to this person. And group work is going to be so powerful, small groups, larger groups in, um, in the work that we're doing because there's no one that could understand what our colleagues are experiencing, what, we're, what you are experiencing, what I'm experiencing as a mental health professional, as other um, clinicians in our field. So if I don't know if there's any more questions or comments. I would love to hear them. Yes, Dr. Gaffney, uh, thank you for, for your excellent um, presentation and overview. We have actually several questions and comments, Great. so I'll, I'll get them to you uh, one at a time so we can address each of them. Uh, one was just a, um, uh, a piece of information, and you've mentioned this on your um, uh, webinars for us before about the head uh, the apps that are available to help reduce with stress so that headspace gives one year free to nurses or healthcare providers and here's another one sync tuition which is also helpful for insomnia provides a free 60 day subscription so that's just a sharing piece of information great but thank you yes and we did mention that calm is another app um, i'm not aware of what they're doing for um, healthcare providers but they have they are primarily known to be a sleep and relaxation app on your phone for your phone. Great, thank you. Now we have several questions. Um, the first uh, first one is, what are your thoughts on using guided meditation about five minutes or so with undergraduate students in clinical settings prior to starting post conference? Absolutely, um, and that is an important essential idea. Um, uh, when we talked in the webinar series about self-care and about guided meditation, and we're actually, we're going to put some guided meditations uh, in, in our resource document, which I will send out um, to all of you. Um, I'll distribute it, have it distributed to all of you. Um, that, and we even recommended for people who are working in critical care areas to find a space. Now, there's, uh, you know, some thought about finding a sanctuary, uh, it, it, but that's not going to happen in a critical care setting. So sometimes it's just standing in front of a window. But I think by doing the guided meditation, and there are several that you can use, there's um, box meditation, there's um, three or four different meditations. You could try a different one each time and see which ones the students like the best. You're, you're really providing um, uh, important information for them to see that this is, this is um, a foundational, um, element of their work that it begins to help them process the information and let them know that they're in a safe space. I would also recommend doing something at the end um, of, of your clinical sessions. And one of the things that you can do is, um, and I can also send this stuff, this will be included in the um, curated list of resources, is a gratitude um, exercise where you identify something that you are grateful for. And I think that's all the, the important work about reframing, um, that this is all, you know, that there are many positive things that are happening. Um, and if you can, um, this is kind of a fun thing to do with your family, um, watch John Krasinski's Some Good News. Um, it's a half hour YouTube program where he only talks about good news. So it's a nice respite. But um, I think the more tools that you give the students, the better off they will be. So thank you for that excellent idea and good luck with it. And make sure you record how your students are responding to all of these uh, tools. Um, your, um, your journaling through all of this will be extremely, extremely important. So I urge you to do that as well. 
Thank you, Dr. Gaffney. And uh, another colleague uh, mentioned Honest Guys is another free online meditation. We have several questions um, for you, so I want to get to them uh, in our time. Okay. Uh, the next one is, as a professional concerned with my discipline, and as a faculty member teaching and graduating seniors this week, I admit to having some anxiety and guilt regarding our situation. We have not changed our grading standards, but part of me feels that our students are not getting the same experience and rigor that we usually demand of our seniors. I believe we've been reasonable with the accommodations we have made, but I cannot help but feel bad. I wonder about the, how these new nurses will cope and how they will be different from previous cohorts even a year out, uh, et cetera. This adds to my distress. I wonder if other faculty are having these feelings. Um, I think that you've um, articulated what everybody else is thinking at Rutgers anywhere where this is going on, you know, where people are trying to get through educational programs and making sure the students are equipped. Um, this um, questioner has really said her, th her thoughts so eloquently um, that I think that it's the kind of thing that should be said out loud to the, to the students. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, we have to be honest with, with everything that we're experiencing. You know, I remember I was teaching um, several courses uh, when I was on the faculty at Columbia um, and the Gulf War um, erupted and um, the first Gulf War. And uh, I remember standing in front of the class which was called um, Families Under Stress, and saying to myself, who am I kidding? There, there is not one person in this room is gonna, who's gonna be looking at the, the curriculum, the, 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 you know, the content of this course um, that I had initially designed. And we, as a group, made changes in the content to make it more relevant for them. And I think the, the very things that are mentioned in this question um, are the kinds of things that you can talk about with students. You know, hope, you know, wanting to make sure that they get what they need. How are they going to continue to get what they need? How can they find mentors and they find other people to support them? Um, there's no question that it is adding to your moral distress um, because you feel like you're not doing enough for them, and yet you're doing every single thing that you possibly can. But to just talk about it with them, to just name it, name it, name it, and say, say to them, this is, this is something that I've been experiencing. And um, Dr. Morrow, I'm not sure how many more weeks you have or when exams start, but this would certainly be a really important um, closing session for your students. Um, to be able to articulate these very concerns. And I, I think that um, several, several uh, schools have told me about the, the, that they're doing small groups and they're doing town halls uh, to address some of these issues. But I think that the naturally uh, existing groups that all of you are engaged in right now in terms of your courses and classes are really the best place to start. Um, and I, I think that sometimes we can't ignore the elephant that's in the room because what you've just mentioned, every one of your students is thinking um, as well. And, and how do you, but how do you get through this? How do you say to yourself, I'm not doing, you know, when you ask the question, I'm not doing the job that I could be, should be doing, these are not times for perfect kinds of experiences. You do the best that you can, and you talk about how doing the best that you can is the right thing for this time, and allowing um, the students to reach out to you and to talk to you. They want to know that they're listening. A study that was done in, um, at Stanford, they really addressed some of the anxieties that their staff were feeling, but it was very simple. It was, you know, um, listen to me, care for me, protect me. Um, guide me. Very simple, um, very simple statements, but that's, that's what they need right now. Even if we can't fix it, um, we can at least listen to it, 
So thank you very much for that wonderful question. That's very helpful. Thank you, Dr. Gaffney. And our seniors are finishing this week. Their grades have to be in by Friday at 11.59, so they're pretty much wrapping up. And then to, uh, Monday's the last day of regular classes and then exams begin, just as a point of, of, of information. We have a few more questions and comments here. So, And, and, um, and Dr. Yes. Morrill, let me just add to that. Sure. If you don't have time, consider writing a letter to your students. And um, I remember doing that when I'd had some really um, challenging moments with uh, some mm -hmm. different issues that were going on in, in other educational settings. And um, it allows, number one, it's very therapeutic for you to write those things. And it, can make, it allows you to contain, to really keep that connection. I think it's really interesting, the number of faculty members who are talking about connecting with their former students during this pandemic is extraordinary. So you have a connection with your students. It may not be the perfect one that you want right now, but you have a connection and they need to know about that going forward. They need to know that they can rely on you going forward. It's healthy for you, it's healthy for them. Sorry. That's wonderful, that's wonderful. And another faculty member shared that she gave her students a time capsule and others we talked about at the faculty meeting recording videos. So there's a question here around, uh, do you anticipate that the feelings of guilt or regret will disappear after this pandemic is under control and that nurses will recover this from this critical situation? Or do you think this will continue to be a traumatizing experience? Well, uh, let me go back to what people were saying um, <clears throat> after September 11th. Um, everyone kept saying that everyone who lives in the tri-state area is gonna be traumatized, that we're gonna have a community of people with PTSD. And Rachel Yehuda, who's done some of the really um, groundbreaking, ground, groundbreaking work on um, PTSD and cortisol levels, simply said, that's not going to happen because people are far more resilient than that. And we know how to reach out to each other. Now, um, that was a one-time event. Yes, it had long-lasting consequences, but it's interesting that people are um, saying now, well, you know, we won't be able we, we won't be able to do this anymore or that anymore. And people after September 11th said we won't build 12 skyscrapers anymore. And yet you can see how that has changed. So I think that um, there is trauma, but I think that there is a way that we can deal with that. Um, I think that the anger and the guilt um, will be addressed. And I think that a lot of healthcare organizations are doing that right now. They're uh, literally asking us to, and I, when I say us, it's um, mental, COVID-19 uh, Mental Health Committee, um, how do they train their staff members to work with um, the, the frontline workers? But the most effective way to, to really help people heal and respond and sort of take a breath and get back to some of their, you know, their pre-traumatic experiences in, um, you know, on the front lines is to, is to really deal with them as a community that community resilience is what we're looking at right now. And we certainly learned a lot about that after 9-11, but now the community is, is the community of nurses. How do we come together? How do we reach out to them? Um, what they're experiencing is common, it's natural, and it's normal. Again, naming those experiences. And sometimes when I respond to um, some of the, the postings I see, uh, I hear um, people say, thank you for validating my experience. That's the first step to validate one's experience. Then the second thing is how do we help those individuals? How do we reach out and help them turn this traumatic situation into a growth promoting situation? There is such a thing called post-traumatic growth um, we can really help them with that and also to reframe those counter stories. And, uh, you know, right now, uh, many of the frontline workers are experiencing 
you know, the, the images, the thoughts the, um, that come into their heads all the time uh, related to their guilt that they can't provide the care that they so want to and that they've been educated to provide. But again, we name it, we promote it, and we tell them that they are doing the best thing that they possibly can. So I think that much of this um, will really fall on the shoulders of the mental health community to reach out and to deal with um, our, our colleagues in, the, in nursing. Um, I heard a number of uh, student, uh, not participants in the earlier webinars say things like, my parents are, are trying to get me to leave nursing. And um, of course they would say that. Who wouldn't say that? You know, you, you, we want to protect our kids. We want to make sure that they are okay. Um, I've had that experience many times where um, my own kids say, well, why do you have to take call tonight? Or are you going to be okay when I was taking call for um, uh, sexual assault survivors coming into an emergency room? But I, what I told this person was that we, um, we stand on the shoulders of the nurse theorists, the nurse researchers, the nurse ethicists who have come before us. And with every single generation, we learn more. We have learned so much from the nurses in palliative care, so much from the nurses in the HIV AIDS community. Um, we have so much we can learn and borrow from those individuals. And this too will be another moment in time where we sit down and say to ourselves, this has been a moment in history where we never thought we would recover. But eventually you will see people contributing, writing about this. We want, we want really our colleagues to write about this and how they can, um, what, what worked for them, what helped. And I think that um, I am anxiously looking forward to the, the research that comes out of um, this moment in time. Um, but I think that just being there for each other, taking care of ourselves, being there for each other, and trying to get be as educated as you possibly can about any of these issues. Um, and, and I dare say that everyone at the, um, that Dr. Morrow certainly knows how to get in touch with me, so I am open to any questions or needs that you might have. The, the bibliography for this webinar series is 15 pages long, and I'm happy to share it with any of you. And again, the resources are really important. How do we come together at a moment like this and, and survive and thrive? Mm -hmm. Thank you. for You're so generous, Dr. Gaffney. Thank you. We have about um, five or six minutes, and I, if I can, sure. I'd like to just summarize some of the comments and questions that are out there so that you hear them. So um, one, one faculty me, uh, member used some humor um, to reach out to her students at the peak of the virus in New York City, and where a number of the, her, her DNP students work as nurses. So she declared a second spring break and gave them an assignment to watch the Abbott and Costello video, who's on first, because there's no, and to answer two, new, uh, two questions, because uh, they were not able to begin baseball. So she contact, you know, used the context there, and then also gave other resources and videos about you know, the difficulty of doing, doing their job and their self care. So, along the lines of what you were saying, I'm hearing a lot of themes of among the faculty about insomnia, inability to sleep. Um, some of our um, faculty members also experiencing, you know, uh, physical, the hot flashes that, that go with their life stage. And then um, also some students expressing anger to faculty around the government and the nursing schools letting them down and not being prepared. And then a comment from a newer faculty member who's, who's actually first time um, teaching full-time students this semester, having a challenge in affording the necessary lenience with assignments, yet grading with the same rigor without seeming callous to the student needs and stresses. And knowing that the students simply cannot do the same quality work given the new demands placed on them, and that all their, the ICU nurses she, she has as students are working on COVID units, have COVID themselves, or have sick family members. So 
lots of lots of feelings out there that that you're tapping into um, with your comments. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for all of you who shared those um, very painful but very uh, important moments. Uh, I'll see if I can get um, <coughs> a lot of resources for sleep. That seems to be um, a really uh, important um, physical element to deal with. So I'm sorry, I'm talking too much these days. Um, and I and I think that um, I love the humor because if we don't laugh, um, it's going to be really hard harder. Uh, so I, I love the uh, giving them a second spring break to uh, to uh, watch Abbott and Costello. Um, there's a lot of really great things out there. Um, I don't recommend anyone watch Contagion, uh, even though it's almost too eerie, too scary to watch because it is so similar to what we're all living right now. Um, so I, I think that um, yeah, and there there and and what I'm hearing are very caring. Um, concerned faculty members, and the interesting thing that usually happens is that the students have a perspective that you don't care, and the faculty has the perspective that you care a lot. So I think that to verbalize how much you care to them um, is with them is so important. Um, the the grading, the you know, giving them some leeway on on grading uh, or or assignments, and then having to really address. Um, Address those assign the grading of those assignments with the same rigor is a um, you know is really tough. Um, I remember when I um, had to change some of the things that I did um, for my students when we were thrust in the middle of the Gulf War. Um, I I gave them the opportunity to hand me a draft first, and I made some comments about that and handed it back to them so that they could. Um, you know, usually uh, so that they could get a second chance at it. I think this is the time that we have to have second chances. Um, and in any way that you can modify things that you feel comfortable doing, that you're not going to, you know, have a, a t moment where you feel that you're not uh, giving them everything they need. Um, but, you know, what would, what would help them? Um, and I've also, the same thing works with families. Um, I often engage kids and, and family members in helping to solve these problems. Um, so I think that that's uh, another way to address it is to, to really hear from them what they think. But it sounds like you all have come up with some great ideas and you should write about it. Well, thank you, Dr. Gaffney and others um, <clears throat> have, uh, said that they they don't usually don't take late assignments but these are unusual times so that you know they they've relaxed that a bit and allowing one late and, and things of that nature uh people are very grateful for for your comments um and um and someone also reached out and said can we as a school of nursing organize a video of faculty for students and that sounds to me like a wonderful idea great idea uh, yeah. it does you know it, these are the moments that um that email and uh, and texts are we use them all the time, but this is also the time when people need to see your faces and hear you. So video is a great idea, great idea. Well, it, it seems we've come to the end of our time, and and this has been fabulous. And and there's a lot of gratitude expressed here to you, Dr. Gaffney, for sharing of yourself and your expertise. Um, as Dr. Gaffney said, I will share. Uh, this presentation, the resources with you, and the way to connect with Dr. Gaffney. Um, thank you so very much. Our next webinar is this afternoon at 3, if, if you're with, uh, available to be with us and or your students. And uh, I would uh, just say that this webinar this afternoon, my colleague, Dr. Peg Pipchik, um, is a family therapist. This is probably the closest we'll get to doing a family session. Um, in this webinar series, so um, it, it's um, it's great. There's a lot of tools in there to use because we all have families that we're dealing with as well. So um, it's so important. So. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Gaffney, and we'll we'll see you later. Thank you all. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank you so much for having me, and good luck, everyone. And don't hesitate to reach out. Okay. Thank you, Donna. We'll see you later, and thank.